court as it does in all the Texas courts, Your Honor. And it's a very simple matter. You rule that they haven't complied with 251, and we get on with the merits. You are perfectly correct, Your Honor. If in the course of today, you decide that you think they ought to be entitled to something, we can deal with that. But all he's doing is what he has always done. This is his playbook I'm objecting to. They come here, and, and the proof is in the pudding. You've never heard the merits of the special appearance. Your Honor, I don't this fall is no longer an track. objection. It's a filibuster. Well, Judge, now, 251, I'm asking you to rule, Your Honor. The, the first, first of all, and I, I would ask then if that's required, which it doesn't say in the statute, that I be allowed to make a trial amendment to verify that. They're on full notice of what our, of what our motion is. Second, you know, the very first uh, case I ever had with these folks, George Spencer got up in an evidentiary hearing and argued after his opening statement that I should not be allowed to make an opening statement. Because again, their perpetual position is, let us show you first, don't allow them any discovery or any right to be heard, and you'll see that, that we're so clearly in the right, you'll rule in our favor. That's not the adversarial system. Would it not, though, Mr. Jeffrey, in effect, to the degree, if ever necessary, bolster or protect the record to have knowledge on the record of their position as to anti-slap and then to be able to appropriately limit and define based upon what is presented what you may need? That would be true if they had not filed extensive anti-slap materials. If you'll recall, Your Honor, Mr. Cedillo made a big deal about bringing you an entire banker's box with their motion. All of their stuff is there. You're supposed to decide this based upon the affidavits and declarations. So that's already in front of the court. The court can just go read everything if, if that's all that is. But I would like to demonstrate to the court what it is we need and why we need it with regard to this. And there are very important constitutional considerations that come in with an anti-slap motion that are built into the rules to give us some level of protection. I haven't got to argue the motion for continuance yet. I would like to argue it, and then he can respond if I mean, he wants. Is there an affidavit that was prepared that just didn't get attached? I don't know what the answer is. Uh, this was a surprise. He stood up. It was a gotcha. I didn't realize. I assume that there's one, but I'd be happy to write one out and sign it subject, you know, as a declaration subject to the penalties of perjury. And Judge, I think the only fair thing to do is what you're indicating is, is perhaps the way to proceed. Let me present the merits of my motion when it's my turn. Beyond, beyond the affidavits that have already been extensively filed and I've still got the box back there in my office. What is there testimony to be presented? No, Your Honor. An anti-slap motion is decided on the declarations and the, the, the papers before you. The whole purpose of the anti-slap motion, Your Honor, is the legislature purposely created a device to get rid of cases if it's appropriate. That the, that you'll see in my presentation, the statute is written in terms of the court shall dismiss. It's not a May situation. And it does not allow the, the normal civil procedure discovery. Uh, it is a heightened burden for them to come to you and request discovery. The, the, the statute is supposed to be operating on a very, very short time frame. That's why we have these deadlines that, that we've had to deal with uh, uh, in the past. Okay. Well, but the court effort, is there discovery <coughs> being requested relative to the anti-slap motion? Yes, and in fact, it's already been requested in connect that it would fall within what was requested in connection with the special appearance. So it's not anything new. And I sent letters to them, and at the last hearing, um, we said, well, you would the, the defendants were to treat those items that I specified and narrowed down, treat those as requests for production and respond to them in the ordinary course of business, which they have not done. And the answer to that, Your Honor, is that was maybe proper discovery under a Rule 128 motion for special appearance. If you'll let me present the content of the statute to you, you will see 
that that is not the scope of discovery that the statute may consider or that you, in applying the statute, may consider appropriate. It's not the kind of discovery that they could send me in any other motion dealing with any other matter. The anti-slap is its own creature, and you have to apply heightened standards, and we do not believe that the requests that are on the record that we've been made notice of, defective motion or not, uh, they included in their motion for continuance what they wanted. I haven't seen any pared down list as to the, the, the anti-slap. I don't need to see it. I know, Your Honor, that the, the statute disfavors it. They don't want you doing a bunch of discovery. It's, it's, a, it's like, a, a, like a rocket docket summary judgment. It is uh, very specific in limiting the discovery and very specific on the requirements they have to meet to show that they're entitled to discovery. And if you'll let us go forward and present the merits, when it's his turn, if he wants to make all those arguments, and if you're persuaded, uh, then then you're free to do what you what you think is right. But what, let me go forward. What's the statute? It's a, 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 a chapter 27, Your Honor, of the uh, Civil Practice and Remedies Code. If you'll let me make my presentation, Your Honor, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the specifics uh, on, on what the discovery requirements are. And, and Your Honor, I'm asking that I be allowed to give my presentation or explanation to the court for why it is that we need a continuance. 27006, Your Honor, uh, under the section titled Evidence, uh, subsection B of 27.006, on a motion by a party or on the court's own motion or on the showing of good cause, the court may allow specified and limited discovery relevant to the motion. And there's, there's authority as to what that means that is, uh, is embedded in my presentation. Again, Judge, I think the approach that you're suggesting, uh, uh, if, if, if you think that's the way to go after you hear it, uh, you're, you're free to go down that road. But, Your Honor, Eric. Yeah, so what's the downside to, based upon the affidavits, the evidence they've presented, to then helping us to properly refine and limit whatever discovery you might have in order to respond? Then is there a downside to that? Yes. What First of all, Your Honor, thus far both parties have put everything that they can put on the table in terms of anti-slap motion and response to anti-slap motion. So the issues are drawn. Let's be honest about where we are today. We're in the courtroom on the issue of persuasion. Both sides want to persuade the court based upon the evidence and the law. But my point would be this. I don't think that Mr. Stabile can have his cake and eat it too. If we were to begin it, he then could not object to your amending your affidavit or in adding to it, can't I see what my point is? Because um, I am trying to, just, we need to get this okay. moved on down the road, slowly, methodically, incrementally, as we've talked about before in a number of different issues. I understand what he's addressing in. I understand what the court is suggesting, and, and, and I see the, the, the the merit in what you're saying, but I do want to make this point, which is that um, there are two sides to the issue that Mr. Cedillo is only telling you one side. One side is that uh, in a conventional slap situation, it's supposed to be expedited, and that is to protect the victim from being crushed by the litigation itself, the expense of the litigation. That's the conventional situation. And the courts, including in the Wallersheim slap case against the Church of Scientology, um, the court made the point that we try to expedite these things to protect someone from, from being harmed. However, there's two protections that we have as the plaintiffs in the case, even in an upside down case like this. 
there, there are two protections that we have. One protection is they have a heavy burden, and we have a light burden. That is, they have to prove by preponderance of the evidence, and we have to just show a prima facie case. That's it. Number two, um, there is a safety valve for the court to allow uh, discovery. The reason being, the plaintiff has due process rights and open court's rights. So the court has to balance it. It's not just rush the plaintiff to the courtroom and, and uh, put them to the test. The reason why we need discovery is that, and we already know it because we know what it is, and we filed a motion for sanctions against them the discovery that's been done thus far, there's been perjury, there's been withholding of documents, etc. What we need is to show that this whole First Amendment claim that they're making is a pure 100% pretext. And they have troves of documents, text messages, emails, reports, etc that shows what they were really doing at the time they were running this operation against the RAF funds. To date, we have been given zero. We know, we know that they exist, and we found a smoking gun. We filed a motion for sanctions on that, which is not set for today. And in that, it, that is, we've got 20-something pages of text messages between the Pope of Scientology, foul mouth hectoring text messages, browbeating his subordinates in OSA you know, over the handling. And what, no. and I'm going to have to respond. But the point is, Your Honor, we have ample indication that there is, in fact, and the practice is to have text messages and emails, etc., exactly what we're claiming in the case. And the point is, Judge, if you'll let me make my presentation on First Amendment law that comes from the United States Supreme Court, all of this motivation stuff that he is making up doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And it isn't a light burden on them. And I've got in my presentation the authority. We have to put on a... a uh, well, the question that I really am trying to get answered though, from Mr. Jeffrey, though, is what is the downside to allowing them to take their best shot in their presentation and to the degree necessary that will, that will assist the court. I would presume it might assist anybody and everybody, including the respondent to that any staff motion to limiting and refining the discovery that might be necessary. And I'm just wondering, I'm trying to figure out, that's why I wanted to open the statute up at the Subtract Primary Code, wanted to find precise chapter and section so I can look at it. And that's, that it's embedded in my presentation, Judge, I'm going to walk you through it. But I want to know, what, is there a downside to that methodology? Or that so then, then they would make their presentation, and then at that... I'll determine if there's, because I, just to be honest with you, I haven't had an opportunity to digest that box of information mm -hmm. after they did and otherwise if they presented and it would be without prejudice to us to That's urge. Right. I don't think he can say King's X. I'm going to present my motion, and then you're not going to give been given an adequate opportunity to respond. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not up to me at that point to say King's X or not, Your Honor. That, that, that's would your it, call. But I have the right to point out that the would statute. Would the rules preclude the court from then refining the discovery? Quite frankly, Your Honor, I think that if you are within the timetable that the, that the rules call for, and there is uh, an extension of the timetable when they show that they're entitled to legitimate proper discovery under, uh, under the anti-slap, and you agree that they are, as long as that discovery and the determination is done within the confines of, of the timetable that is set there, because you don't get to push it past uh, the, the extension because you found the discovery might be proper. So then I think would, you're free to do. What would that 
date be? Uh, that was in my letter, Your Honor. I think that mid-February was uh, was. Uh, but we confirmed that's yeah. where we should it, it, it operate. That's for the completion of the entire hearing. But yes, sir, it's February the fifteenth. Yes, sir. That that yeah. Yeah. The if if yeah. you grant discovery, if you think if they meet their burden. On, I don't know yet. On, on the state. Yes, and that's why I think we're too people to make perfect sense. He hasn't asked your question. Is there a downside? I think that's very telling. Judge, may I ask a question? Mr. Jeffers is going to get into, I don't know, some material issues in this case. Are we still going to have the video camera going, or are we going to go ahead and let that No, we're getting ready to take a break, and then while they're still huddling, I will just say that anybody that's counsel or paralegal or assisting counsel that wants to use electronic devices needs to be in front of the rail, basically just from here on out, and uh, just everybody else that needs to take notes of some sort can do so with pencil and paper behind the rail, but all electronic devices behind the rail just need to be off. I like the airplane, we're getting ready to take off. <laughs> you know, Judge, they're letting you keep it on now as long as you're an airplane. <laughs> <laughs>